Welcome to my talk, Keeping Secrets with JavaScript. Today, I'm going to give an introduction to the WebCrypt API. I'm Tim Talbert. I have been working for Mozilla Berlin since 2011. I usually work in the desktop version of Firefox, and they're on a variety of different front-end features, mostly written in JavaScript. I discovered the WebCrypt API a few months ago and started writing patches for the stuff that was missing in Firefox. Our implementation has since remarkably improved, and we now support most of the exciting algorithms that are listed in the spec. I would not call myself a cryptographer, but the work I do here is reviewed by very experienced people that help me look out for the right things and make sure I'm not having too much fun with NSS. That is our native crypto library, by the way. So you might ask, why do we need a crypto API? As the web platform is becoming more mature, developers are asking for it. You can either provide an API or watch them use crypto libraries written in JavaScript. Plugins or add-ons are not an option either for, for full web stack devices, like, for example, a Firefox OS phone, where we could use the WebCrypto API to securely store the pin of your lock screen. We could write a password manager web app. We can basically, securely, we can basically secure or encrypt any local storage on the device. But also, websites can make use of the WebCrypto API to encrypt data before sending it to the server via TLS to avoid any trace of sensitive data in server logs. There certainly are a lot more valid use cases, but they would probably fill another talk. We have a lot to cover today, so let's dive headfirst into the example that will guide us through the talk. I do indeed want to build another notes app with you, because I think that's just a great and simple example. We don't have to talk about the UI anymore. Everyone knows what these apps look like, and most of you have probably already written one. Our app will be a little different, though, as we will be using cryptography to protect against various scenarios. To follow the example, you should be familiar with typed arrays, and you should know how to work with promises. At the end of the talk, you will know the basics of the WebCrypto API and see that it helps us implement a notes app with a safe and local storage with only a few lines of code. And we will achieve all that without using any external JavaScript crypto libraries, and it will work in Firefox 33 and Chrome 37. So as I said before, we don't care about the UI. So let's start by taking a closer look at the storage. I picked local forage. That is a small wrapper that automatically chooses the best supported backend for you. That is hopefully NixDB, but it might also be local storage. Local forage is great. We can directly pass any data, and we automatically get an async promise-based API for free. This is how we would use our storage API then. It doesn't really care about the particular format. We could pass whatever, even plain text. But as maintainers of the API, we immediately start to think of a few, few things that could go wrong here. Let's say we are worried about silent data corruption not in particular about losing data, but about the wrong data being stored. We certainly don't want the corruption to change the amount of money we owe Alice. And so the first thing that comes to mind is to add some sort of integrity checking. And as it turns out, cryptographic hash functions are excellent at providing integrity. I assume that most of you have probably seen hash digests before when downloading big files from FTP servers like an Ubuntu DVD image. You would, download the f you would calculate the hash digest over the file you just downloaded and then compare it to the hash digest that is given on the website to check for corruptions. And if the file was corrupted, you would throw it away and re-download it. In our example, we will be using SHA-256, that is a cryptographic hash function of the SHA-2 family. Given the exact same input, hash functions always return the same output. If only one bit changes, a good hash function returns a totally different result. Variable length data goes in, and fixed size data comes out. That is 32 bytes, or 256 bits for SHA-256. For a good hash function, it should be hard to find two different inputs mapping to the same output. Or as a cryptographer would say, it should be hard to find a collision for this hash function. The WebCrypt API provides a simple digest function. We just pass the desired hashing algorithm and the data to calculate the digest form. It takes an array buffer, and it returns a promise that will also resolve to an array, to an array buffer. All cryptographic operations are defined in the namespace window.crypto.subtle. Cryptographic operations can be quite expensive, so all these methods return promises and do their work asynchronously. Implementers can thus easily move all the heavy work off the main thread. Subtle, by the way, is supposed to reflect 
that many of these low-level algorithms have subtle usage requirements, and those need to be satisfied in order to provide the required security guarantees. Or worded slightly differently, they really want you to know what you're doing because it's easy to scrub. I would have maybe suggested a somewhat more blunt naming, but that ship has sailed. We will see more API examples later, but let's start using the digest function to provide integrity for our notes app. This is our basic storage API that I showed earlier, and we will start by modifying the save function. Now, instead of only saving notes, we also want to store a hash digest for integrity checking. Using promise.all here to store both the values makes the code a little nicer because it waits until all, all promises passed to it are resolved and thus lets the caller know when we're done saving. Now, we of course need to compute the digest for the given notes argument and thus call crypto.settle.digest with SHA-256 as the hash function and pass the notes. As the Web Crypto API operates on typed arrays only, we should probably change our safe, or our safe function signature to make it clear that it takes array buffers now instead of any JavaScript value. So now that we stored everything we need to know for integrity checking, let's implement the actual check and take a look at the load function. We will use promise.all again to read both the notes and the hash digest. And as soon as those are loaded, we want to compute a digest of the notes we just read from disk. And using the compare function, we then compare that to the hash value we read, we read from disk. Compare here is basically just a simple function that takes two typed arrays and simply compares them byte by byte. And if the digests are equal, we resolve to the notes that we read from disk, or otherwise we will just implicitly resolve to undefined. Using a cryptographic hash function, we have now solved our data integrity problem, and we can easily detect accidental corruption. We are, however, not at all protected against deliberate changes. An attacker can compute the digest just as we do. This is especially easy with their browser's dev tools nowadays, but even without that, it's not really a challenge. It would be great to somehow combine a secret with a hash function so that we can prevent deliberate changes. What we are currently missing is authenticity. When reading data from disk, we want to be sure it was written by someone that knows a specific secret. And if the attacker doesn't know the secret, they can convince us that the data on disk is genuine. HMAX, or hash-based message authentication codes, are a cryptographic construction that is excellent at providing both integrity and authenticity. This construction uses hash functions in combination with the secret key to compute a valid authentication code for any data we does need to know the secret key. And the hash function we will use for HMAC will be SHA-256, as we have already seen in the previous example. Now, whereas hash functions only take a single input and return a digest, HMACs take a key as well. That is the secret key that we need to know to compute a valid Mac. Combining the data and key inputs, these functions return a message authentication code and we can use this code later for integrity and authenticity checking. Given the exact same data and the exact same key, the HMAC function will always return the same message authentication code. This looks quite similar to how we used digest before, but this time we use the sign function and additionally pass a key argument. The promise returned will resolve to the message authentication code for the given data under the given key. And instead of comparing the digest byte by byte manually now, we can use the verify function provided by the API. We just pass a key, the Mac, and the data, and it will then resolve to a Boolean that tells us whether the Mac is valid for the given data under the given key. So let's update our storage save function to use an HMAC instead of a hash digest. We first replace the digest function with the sign function, pass HMAC as the algorithm, and the secret key. Both the notes and the Mac we computed are stored in the backend. And note that our save function now takes a key argument. To verify the stored Mac upon loading, let's update the load function. We don't load a hash from disk anymore, but a Mac. And instead of computing a digest and comparing those manually, we can now use the verify function to compute a Mac and verify that at the same time. The promise returned by verify will resolve to a Boolean that tells us whether the Mac is valid for the given data under the given key. And if all goes well, we resolve to the notes that we read from disk, or otherwise we will again resolve to undefined. 
our load function takes a key argument now as well. And I hope you're wondering, where does that key come from? The most straightforward thing we could probably do is to just prompt the user for a password and use that as the key, right? The problem is that passwords are not cryptographic keys. They have a lot less entropy, and they don't look like random at all. Just think of how they're composed. They consist of printable characters only, maybe some numbers, and mostly the same special characters like punctuation marks. That means we can't use passwords directly, but there is a way to derive cryptographic keys from low entropy keys like user type passwords. And that is what we call key derivation. Key derivation is the process of deriving a second key from a given key. The WebCrypto API provides the derived key method. It expects the key derivation algorithm to use the base key to derive from, whether the algorithm that the derived key will be used for, whether the key is extractable, that means whether below exporting it to a different format, and what we plan to use it for, signing, verifying, encrypting, decrypting, and so on. The promise returned will resolve to a crypto key object, and that key can then be used for any cryptographic operation as given within the constraints of the last three parameters. In our example, we will, be spe we will specifically use the PBKDF2 algorithm. That is an acronym for password-based key derivation function and was especially designed to derive cryptographic keys from low entropy user type passwords. So how does this work? Looking at the parameters, Password is obviously the password as given by the user. The salt is a non-secret random value that defends against rainbow table attacks. Rainbow tables are pre-computed tables with hashes for all popular passwords and their variations. By using a random salt, you would have to pre-compute a table for every possible salt value. And for example, when using eight random bytes as the salt, we would thus need to pre-compute two to the 64 of those tables which makes an attack practically infeasible, because for most of the people, it's just too much data to store. Now, in our case, an attacker could just take the public salt value we have here and start a dictionary attack, where they would simply try all, the pos all popular passwords and slight variations until they found our secret key. And to slow down this kind of attack, we specify a number of iterations high enough such that, say, instead, instead of a million passwords per second, an attacker could only try a few hundred passwords per second. With 5,000 iterations as given here, the inner computation of PBKDF2 would be executed 5,000 times over and over, and thus slow down the key derivation, but also the attack by roughly a factor of 5,000. It is important to note, however, that this does not protect us from weak keys. If the user chooses 1234 as the password, the attacker is still going to be able to find it very quickly. So let's start using PBKDF2 for our notes app. We create a function called derive key that we pass a crypto key containing the user's password, and we pass a salt. The function takes the salt as an argument instead of randomly generating it, because we only want to gener generate it once and then store it. We need the same salt to arrive at the exact same key later again. The derived key will be used for HMAC. We will sign when saving and verify when loading. Let's now create two more functions for both of the arguments, starting with the password key. Creating a key that contains the user's password is actually really easy. We can call generate key with pbkdf2 as the algorithm. As the algorithm, usually generate key would generate a random key. For pbkdf2, however, it would open a native dialog that is asking the user to type a password. That is pretty nice, as the user's password will never make it to JavaScript in the clear, and only the native parts of the browser know about it, and the API will only return a key pointer back to JavaScript. Lastly, let's define the getSalt function. We want to generate the salt only once, and then store it. Using crypto.getRandomValues, we generate a few random bytes to use as the salt. GetRandomValues is a cryptographically secure pseudorandom number generator and the only method that is not in crypto.subtle, and the only method that is synchronous. The typed array passed to it will simply be filled with pseudorandom bytes. And to prevent the rainbow table attacks I talked about before, we pick eight random bytes as the salt here. An attacker would thus have to pre-compute two to the 64th of those huge tables. Putting it all together, we can now just use the three functions we defined. We first retrieve the user type password and the salt, which is read from disk or generated on the first launch. 
Given the password and the salt, we can now derive a cryptographically secure key using PBKDF2. And finally, pass that to the storage safe function. And that will then use it to generate an HMAC for the given buffer. This is what our storage contents look like now. We store the salt to derive an HMAC key using password-based key derivation. Upon saving, we use that derived key to compute an HMAC and store it. And upon loading, we use the drive key to verify the data by comparing HMACs. That is pretty cool so far. The only thing an attacker could now do is modify or store data and make us discard it. We could probably implement some kind of online backup mechanism, but that doesn't feel great as long as the data we store is still plain text. And it's probably not great either that simply having access to our computer still exposes all of our notes. We finally arrived at what I assume most of you think about when hearing the word cryptography, that's encryption. We want secrecy, and we achieve that by encrypting our notes in a way that at the same time, at the same time provides integrity and authenticity. Unsurprisingly, we will use the encrypt function offered by the WebCrypto API to encrypt data. We pass the cipher to use for encryption, the key, and the data to encrypt. It then returns a promise that resolves to the encryption of the given data under the given key. Calling decrypt with the same key and the encrypted data will just give us the plain text again. AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, is a very popular cipher. We will use it in a special mode called the Galois Counter mode. AES alone does only provide secrecy, but it doesn't provide protection against corruption or tampering. And GCM will do exactly that for us. AES GCM does not only take a key to encrypt data, but it also takes a nonce, that is a number only used once, and somewhat similar to the salt we saw for PBKDF2 before. The nonce is used to implement randomized encryption. If we use a new random nonce every time we encrypt, then even the exact same plain text will always yield a different ciphertext. So if we save without changing anything, then the stored ciphertext will still be different every time. Because in the world of cryptography, we don't even want an attacker to know that nothing has changed. The result of the encryption will be an array of bytes, that is the ciphertext with the message authentication code appended. That means we don't need to separately store the MAC anymore, but just like, just like the salt for PBKDF2, we now need to store the nonce to be able to properly decrypt later. We switched from using HMAC to AESGCM for encryption, we thus first have to update our derived key method we created when talking about PBKDF2 earlier. Here, we simply change the algorithm that we plan to use the derived key for from HMAC to AES-GCM. And that key will now be used for encryption and decryption. Using AES for our safe function is actually quite simple. We generate random nonce using get random values. It is important that the nonce is long enough, say 16 bytes, so that it is highly unlikely we generate the same random nonce twice and would thus use the same random nonce twice to encrypt. We switch to using the encrypt function instead of the sign function now and pass AESGCM and the nonce as parameters. We then store the ciphertext and the nonce to be able to properly decrypt later. The next thing we now have to do is to decrypt in the load function. The load function now loads the ciphertext and the nonce from disk and passes those to the decrypt function. If integrity and authenticity can be verified, the promise will resolve to the plain text nodes, and if the verification fails, the promise will be rejected and be just resolved to undefined again. That's pretty much it. We now have a notes app that safely encrypts its data with a user type password, and the best part is we achieved all that without using any JavaScript crypto libraries and with only just a few lines of code. The examples given here work in Firefox, although it's still hidden behind a preference, and they work in Chrome, although Chrome unfortunately does not support the whole password-based key derivation I talked about yet. To make sure everyone understands how we got here, let's do a quick recap. I hope that for those of you who could not follow the code, a few diagrams will help understand things better. The first step we took was to harden our simple storage by adding integrity checking. Now, we did not only store the nodes themselves anymore, but also an additional SHA-256 digest to check for corruptions when loading. 
And if the two digests did not equal, we simply discarded the nodes. The second step was to add authenticity checking. Now, we could not only detect accidental corruption, but also deliberate changes. We here stored the nodes, and the Mac computed using the HMAC construction. And if the Mac did not verify under the given key, we would again discard the nodes. At this stage, we did not have a key yet to use for HMAC, though. So the next logical step was to look at password-based key derivation using PBKDF2. We prompt the user for a password and use that to derive a cryptographic key. And in addition to the nodes and the Mac, we now also have to store the salt so that we arrive at the same key every time when deriving. All right, that doesn't work. I'll do this. And as the last step, we added encryption to our notes app. We stored the salt for key derivation, the encrypted notes, and the nonce. The nonce was the random value that changes with every save operation and was used to implement randomized encryption. If the encrypted nodes do not pass integrity and authenticity checks under the derived key, we will just simply discard them again. You can find the code for all intermediate steps we talked about on GitHub. We're almost done, but I didn't want to leave you without the obligatory reminder that before using the API for real-world applications, make sure that your knowledge is sufficient and ask for review from experienced peers. Cryptography is hard, but I'm sure you heard that a lot already, and we have all seen it in especially the last year. What I actually want to do is to encourage you to brush up your crypto skills. Go out there and help make the web a better place. I would be super happy if this talk could motivate you to learn more about cryptography. These two courses were a tremendous help for me and a whole lot of fun. Cryptography One actually started a week ago again, and you could still join it if you want. You can, of course, also watch the YouTube videos whenever you want, but they're not quite as dense and take a while to watch. I will post the slides on my blog later, and they will have links, for more, they have, they will have links to more information. If you want to talk to me about the Web Crypto API, Mozilla, or anything, you can find me hanging out at the Mozilla launch later. Thank you. <laughs>